Market forces and fragmenting consumer tastes put pressure not just on the stores we shop at, but also on agriculture itself. Joining us now for more on that pressure, Andrew Campbell is here. He's a dairy farmer at Belson Farms, also known in social media circles as Fresh Air Farmer. And Al Mussel is here, research lead at AgriFood Economic Systems, and we're happy to have both of you gentlemen here at TVO tonight. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Uh, 17,000 followers on Twitter, <laughs> I want to start with you here. Should we do this off the top? Let's do a screen grab of Andrew's Twitter page. There it is right there. And uh, yeah, 17,000 plus followers. You're not doing badly at all. How many of those followers do you figure are farmers? Probably half, I would say. Just when I first started Twitter, it was always about connecting with other farmers. So it was 100% at one time, but started taking pictures and kind of more consumers have followed suit. So you think half farmers, half consumers? Generally, and I And why guess. are you doing it? You know, I just enjoy taking pictures around the farm. I have for a few years on Twitter, decided the first of the year that I wonder if I could do one every single day. And then people paid attention, so I had to then after that. So it, it's just worked really well since. Now you have an audience to serve. You can't stop. Well, and that's the thing. I have to. And, and it's almost addictive now. I look around and, you know, what's today's picture going to be? Do you get feedback? Um, quite a bit, actually. It, actually, yes, yesterday or the day before, I had one from a kindergarten class, wanted to know how much the, a newborn calf weighed, and then I guess they weighed all themselves and they found out that they weigh less than a newborn calf. <laughs> Just neat stories like that. Yeah, so there's a kind of an educational angle to this as well. Yeah, I've heard actually quite a few schools do that, that they've been doing that, and even one um, I heard just last week, a university class is including it in a critical thinking uh, segment. Hmm, not bad at all. Mm -hmm. I presume part of why you do this is because um, most of the province lives in cities, and most people who live in cities now have no first-hand experience with farming at all. Is that right? Absolutely. And, and you know, being kind of around consumers and even just friends of mine that don't come from a farm, you know, the questions that you get, you start to realize that there really is a lack of understanding of what's going on on the farm. You know, we read books, what's on the internet, watch TV shows, and start to get an idea. but. You know, from my experience around our farm, that's not usually the case of what's going on. So can a few pictures kind of help to at least give people a little better idea of what's going on on the farm? I hope so. And where is the farm? farm is uh, west of London, Strathroy, Ontario. Strathroy, Ontario. Okay, know where that is, and what do you do there? Uh, we milk cows and then uh, also grow corn, soybeans, wheat, and hay. How many cows you got? 50 cows, milking cows, and then all the ones that don't milk, the little ones, and uh, a little bit of veal as well. Uh, 125 is the herd size. And are you up there at 4 and 5 in the morning? 4, quarter after, or quarter to 5 this morning, I was up and started milking and feeding cows and came here. Why do you enjoy it? Um, part of it is the... You know, you, you get to look out at the end of the day. I always like, you know, summertime, sit out on the porch and realize, you know, the cows are out on the pasture, the corn's growing on the other side of the driveway. Like, you've accomplished this today. And then, you know, we've got two really young kids. And when I was a kid, you know, going to the barn, like, what an awful, I have to work in the barn. No other kids have to do that. But then, you know, once I grew up, I realized what kind of lessons that gave me. And it, it just brought me back to the farm to realize that I wanted my kids to experience that too. Al, you do get to speak eventually, but I got a couple of more questions here for Andrew, just because just we're on a roll here. Would you say it's a typical dairy farm? Um, probably we're a little smaller than the average in Canada. The average is uh, getting closer to 80. Around us, we'd be one of the smaller ones, you know, 100 cows kind of around the corner and 200 cows a few miles down the road. Um, but certainly, you know, across the country, it would be a little smaller than average. And we hear this expression all the time now, organic farming. Would you say what you do is organic farming? No, organic farming um, is defined, you have to feed your cattle organic grains, organic feed. We do not feed them organic feed. We do, you know, they do have access to pasture, which is one uh, requirement of organic as well, at least through the summertime. But certainly, certainly on the feed side, we don't feed organic feed. Because? Um, part of it is around... Uh, one, you know, my own beliefs, I, I don't feel that organic offers um, any benefits. Certainly, you know, my kids eat non-organic food because I believe in the system that we grow for. Um, the other one comes down to, you know, the cost of it. Organic feed is quite expensive. The requirement to grow your own organic feed takes four years to get to that point, um, you know, which, you know, economically, I've still got to worry about our farm and, you know, the progress and being able to feed the kids at home. 
uh, you know, it, it just hasn't penciled out for us. What do you make of the fact that it seems increasingly nowadays more people are more interested in more than just uh, how much this costs and whether it tastes good. They are interested in whether it's organic, whether it's local, how it all came together, all of that. What do you make of that? Well, I think part of it is going back to earlier, you know, what we read and what we see on the internet and the movies we watch and all of that. You start to get an idea of, okay, what, what kind of food do I want to eat? What kind of, uh, you know, story do I want behind? And we almost get kind of a nostalgic feel for, you know, what our food is and what it could be. So, you know, we make choices based on that. You know, from my perspective, you know, I think it's great that people want to have a little better connection to their food. The biggest challenge, though, comes down to, you know, where did that, you know, need come from and where's the beliefs behind it? Are the beliefs actually what's going on on, you know, a mainstream, far mainstream farm like mine? Or is it just kind of, you know, what we hope for, wishful thinking that maybe isn't even possible in the first place? Okay, hold that thought to be continued. Al, you get to speak now. Here we go. Uh, it's time to hear from The Economist. Uh, basic Business 101 theory. Find a niche. Find a need in the marketplace and then fill it. It's the same idea with agriculture? Absolutely. You know, we've got a market-based agricultural system. Tremendous amount of diversity among farms. And uh, this is what business people do. They, they seek out those niches. And, uh, you know, we've got commodity-based agriculture. We've got more niche-based agriculture. And there's enough diversity out there to cater to all of it. I don't want to get into a big debate on supply management because we've done that already, but when you say, yes, we work like any other sector of the economy, not really, right? Well, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. It, you know, at the end of the day, the farms are operated by family businesses, and uh, they compete in different ways. They can compete in commodity businesses, they can compete in businesses that are supply managed, and they compete in, uh, you know, in the periphery of urban areas. Uh, local food, fruits and vegetables, there, there's any number of ways they can do it. And it's, and it's a very diverse system. Okay, let me follow up on where we ended up with Andrew, which is you are seeing as well this sort of growth in free range, free run, you know, antibiotic, uh, hormone free, you know, all of this kind of stuff that's happening right now. Is this having an economic impact on the agricultural sector? It, it, it is, I don't know how easy it is to measure. And I think the, the, the first thing is, you know, this is the, the growth in awareness is tremendous benefit, I think, from the standpoint of giving opportunities for people to market uh, farm products in a particular way to cater to, to some of those interests. Uh, we do worry that where some of them aren't particularly well thought out, you know, Andrew made reference to some of the costs, um, you know, the other aspect of that is we just think about the natural resource base. So if if sustainable is coming to be thought of as being free from particular, um, whether it's antibiotics or pesticides or fertilizers or, or different technologies, GM, et cetera, what we end up doing is we end up compensating for the loss of those technologies with more of the natural resource base that's drawn in. And we do worry about that. Worry about it in what respect? Well, basically, as, as you take technologies out of the farmer's toolbox, you know, the, the logical result of that ultimately is to bring more land into production just to maintain the same supply. And of course, we're not just maintaining the same supply. We need to grow the supply. If people, um, I don't want to stereotype anybody here, but let's, let, let's just do it for the hell of it. If city types, you know, in downtown Toronto or downtown Ottawa want to pay more for their food because they think it's organic or local or, you know, makes them feel better or whatever, Got a problem with that? You, you know, uh, it's a difficult subject. Because, you know, first of all, food is a very personal thing for people. It's, you know, it's part of their culture, part of the way they define themselves, part of what they do with their spare time, uh, the care they take of their families, and so on. So, so I think we have to respect that. And it creates a lot of opportunities for farmers, uh, food companies, retailers, et cetera, and, 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 and that's terrific. What we worry about, though, is where some of these beliefs are... Um, uh, misconceived or or have uh, just simply incorrect ideas about for example the sustainability traits of uh, of what's being contemplated Let's do it uh, for instance antibiotics uh, antibiotics are a great example pesticides are, are another one so let's use pesticides for example sure. you know uh, pesticides are something that farmers have in their toolbox to combat whether it's insect infestations or weed infestations okay as the weed population goes up the yield of the crop goes down. 
The only way we can replace that, if we bring that, begin that technology, if we take that technology out, is to bring more land into production. And and I think the literature, the scientific literature, is quite unambiguous that that's the most unsustainable thing that we can do. You know, we take away wildlife habitat, we take away wetlands and so forth to bring in agricultural agricultural production. So what we try to do is we try to uh, get as much yield we can out of a particular footprint in in agriculture. Now, of course, we can't can't destroy the land base in doing so, so we have to make sure we have appropriate technologies and that they're used appropriately. Um, but as we back away from those, that's the logical outcome of this, and that's a very bad outcome. Let me just make sure I get this, and, uh, Andrew. So, for example, if, if in an effort to buy pesticide-free whatever, or hormone-free beef or whatever, if the end result of that is having more land go into production, the bigger picture suggests that's actually environmentally less sustainable? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, certainly, you know, we look around our area. You know, we've got a few spots around our farm that we don't, uh, you know, we don't harvest anything off of. It's kind of, you know, wooded areas around creeks, things like that. If all of a sudden, you know, we're in a position that either the price of those products because of the supply and demand, the price goes through the roof, or we get to a position where, you know, we need more acres to kind of sustain the farm, then we start looking at those, well, here's an acre that really is just for the deer and trees, you know, does it need to be part of the equation? And I know when, you know, crop prices last had their big spike, we saw uh, in the U.S. in conservation reserve programs all of a sudden go into production of agriculture that were really just kind of wildlife habitat before. So the alternative to that is what? Well, the alternative to that is taking a look at the technologies that are available to us. As you know, Al mentioned, we've got uh, you know pesticides for things like you know a soybean aphid, a little bug you you have to look to find, and you've got to find 200 of them on a plant before you want to spray it. But when it gets over that, it actually could have a serious implication on that crop, destroying it. So then it comes down to you know for us. We need that crop to be able to keep the farm sustainable, so you know we ha we have to spray it. So it's one of those things that you know we cannot, and and certainly in the organic, you know we talk about uh, you know most people assume it's pesticide free. Well, it's just a different kind of pesticide. It's a natural pesticide that isn't you know necessarily you know created out of a lab or out of a chemical process, but grown still goes through a plant and then is sprayed. So. Um, you know, the, it, it really comes down to kind of that, it does come down to the consumer preference, but at the same time, you know, there has to be that idea that, okay, just because I can afford the food, does that mean we want to make it expensive for everybody else who can? I hear you, but uh, on the other hand, for the foodies yeah, yeah. Who, want to, who want to spend more money yeah. and have it to spend yeah. uh, because they want to get pesticide-free, hormone-free, antibiotic-free, yeah. you know, all of that business, do you have an issue with that? Well, I don't necessarily have an issue with that. It comes down to, though, you know, we're in a position now, you know, politically, where it's not just about I'm going to go to the grocery store and make my own choices, but I'm going to go to Queen's Park and make sure that it's legislated that that's changed because that's what I prefer and that's what I want to do. And that's where the much bigger challenge comes in that instead of it's just my choice, I'm going to tell everybody else how to, how to eat as well. Well, and I, and, and I think there's a related issue with that. There's, you know, there's, there's the foodies that, uh, that believe very strongly in this, and, and that's great because that's important for them. There are, there are certain farmers that, that are in a position to be able to serve that market. The challenge comes when we have large retail banners that come in and say, well, okay, we don't want to stock any potted flowers that are treated with neonic insecticides, or we don't want GM product. Well, if these were, you know, sort of small niche type retail outlets, that's, that, that's one thing. That's an opportunity for somebody. When they're very, very large, then suddenly farmers are confronted with uh, restrictions reality. to market yeah. access using technologies that we've had uh, public approval of. Hmm. So we're, we, we end up getting caught in a bit of a jam here. And I should just, because uh, some people are going to get confused. You're not talking about General Motors, obviously, when you talk GM. You mean genetically modified yes, organisms. Yes, yes, okay, correct. just to be clear, because not everybody that, yes. follows all the acronyms yeah. around here. Yeah, okay. so, so, you know, we, we've got uh, Health Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, Pest Management Regulatory Agency, that approve specific technologies, uh, pesticides. Um, Why do you keep calling pesticide a technology? It's not, it's not really a technology, it's is a it? It's a chemistry. 
Sure, it's chemistry. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's a that's a type of technology, um, and and these are approved products. You know, we worry about the day, and and I don't think we have to worry about the day because it's happening now. We've got farmers that use this accepted technology. They can demonstrate to use it properly, and they have limits on their market access. Well, let's talk. Um, Let's talk dairy here. Sure. You don't do organic. No. When you see other farmers who do do the organic milk thing, mm -hmm. what do you guys talk about? Um, well, certainly, you know, it comes down to for a lot of them, you know, what does you know your own personal belief, you know, kind of fits into it a little bit. But then also, you know, the economic reality has to be part of it. You know, we we certainly want to produce the best food we can out the driveway. Yeah. But do you ever say to these guys, guys, you're making me look bad here. Ease well, up. Well, no, because it's one of those things that usually, from what I see in a lot of it, is you know, it's it's just merely, as you said, filling that market demand that exists. You know. We've got one that's a few miles away. You know, they're not putting up signs telling me, you know, I'm glad I'm drinking my milk instead of this guy's instead. Um, you know, it, it just really is two farmers doing it a little bit differently, filling their own markets. Can farmer? Sorry, you wanted to follow up on that? Yeah. Go ahead. You know, the, the organic farmers that, that, that I've spoken to, I've met quite a few of them over the years, a lot of them will say, you know, I just wanted to farm differently. And, uh, you because know, on the, on, on the livestock side, because they just felt that way. They, you know, they, they had a particular perspective on it. So, you know, on antibiotics, you know, can, is it possible to raise livestock without antibiotics? Yes. It's being done in Europe. Organic farmers are doing it here. It takes a very special skill set. It's a difference, you know, you're going to sacrifice some other aspects of your farm to be able to do that. And in, in some ways, I have a great deal of respect for the people that can do that because that's difficult to do. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's some side effects with that. I mean, you know, there's some there's some animals that don't get treated with particular products that would have otherwise. Do you share the view of Andrew, though, that you don't want to see any laws mandating? No. I, organic I, I, farming? Yes, I do share you that You do view. share that yeah. view. Okay. Yeah. You wanted to follow up well, on something? Well, certainly, you know, on the organic, on the dairy side, um, you know, antibiotics can be used. The withdrawal period is just extended, and you can only treat them twice per year. So it's not a case of the technology's out completely. Um, you know, it, it just changes, um, you know, how you manage that a little differently. Let's talk about income for a second here. And, and to that end, we know that many farmers in Ontario nowadays uh, have got income coming away from farming. Uh, who knows? They got a wind turbine on their property or whatever. They're getting income from different uh, options. Uh, let's, let's go to the economist first. Is that because agriculture just doesn't pay as a way of life anymore? Well, this is a trend that's been growing for, for many years. You know, if you go back to uh, the 1930s, 30% 30 of the Canadian population were in primary agriculture. That has been declining ever since. What is it now? Uh, somewhere around 2%. 2%. With, with a pretty, that's a pretty generous definition of what a farmer is. And still feeding everybody. Uh, oh, absolutely. It's, mm -hmm. it's been an enormous success story in terms of uh, productivity. But we have a lot of people that... Um, in, enjoy being outside, maybe enjoy livestock, enjoy machinery um, that have essentially full-time jobs or part-time jobs and, and also farm. And in fact, when we look at the overall statistics, you know, if, if you look at, um, for example, farms with sales of under 100,000, it's more than half of the farms. That's sales, so that's not the, that's not the profit. So something else, other forms of income are supporting those types of enterprises and um, does that suggest, though, that this really is not a viable way of life anymore? No, I don't think so. I, no. I, I, I think it's, uh, first of all, it's consistent with the market-based orientation of agriculture in, in which people choose their own sort of way to go about handling their businesses, what scale they want to operate, uh, whether they want to have off-farm work, um, uh, et cetera. And, and, and I think that's really the primary driver hmm. of it. Let's talk scale for a second, because you've said you're a small operator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Scale important in your world? Certainly. I mean, you know, we, as we come home to the farm, my wife and I, um, you know, we're doing the same thing that my grandfather did and my father did, and that's how are we going to grow it in the next, you know, kind of 20 or 30 years when we're on the farm. So certainly when we came home to the farm, even five years ago, it was 30 five cows was in the barn. In five years, it's 50. You know, we hope that in, um, you know, in another five or 10 years, you know, it's 75 plus, just because, you know, for us on the farm, you talk about off-farm work, both my wife and I kind of do some part-time freelance contract stuff to kind of fill in the holes. 
But certainly the goal is how can we build it so we're home full time all the time, and and part the scale has to be part of that. But that does uh, well. I should ask you. I mean, does it speak to the fact that what you're trying to do on the farm is not a sustainable financial way of life? Because you both got jobs on the side. Well, I think part of it, part of it is that what was a farm for always one family is now for two. So instead of just my parents taking an income, now it's my parents and us taking an income. So, so it's one of those, you know, where we've we found the space that both my wife and I don't have to work off the farm now. Um, you know, we can both kind of do it part time instead, which works well. But but really, it is about you know how how are we finding instead of just one income, two incomes now from the same operation. How old are your kids? Uh, one and three. Oh, so it's a bit early to ask whether or not they're going to be going into no, this line of work as no, well. No, certainly, and you know who knows if they want to. But yeah. f but from my, my perspective, is I want it that if they want that option. Um, you know, we're going to have it as economically viable, as sustainable, you know, for the cows and land as possible, that if they decide, that is an option they can have. How concerned are you, Andrew, that as consumer choice, I think it's fair to say, consumer choice for organic, local, you know, non horm all these things we've been talking about, it's growing. Mm -hmm. How concerned are you that the model that you've got in place mm -hmm. is going to be out of step with the times? going forward? Well, I think it's it's one of those where we're we keep looking at the business model, you know, on, you know, an annual or every couple of years basis to say, okay, are we still in the right position that makes this farm as viable as possible? If if every consumer wanted organic milk, we'll start producing organic milk. That's not the issue. Um, it, it really comes down to, you know, what is best for our operation, um, you know, and, and where do we think we fit in kind of the farm community. And what price you can get for it. And what price what you, you can get to it. It, it. it has to be part of it. Al, I notice a and is now marketing its burgers as better production, right? Better production, be, better because of the production methods they use. Yeah, they, they've said that they've taken hormone or, hormones out of their supply right. chain. Right, and Chipotle yeah. did something like this earlier as well, I think. Did they not? Yes. Okay, so they're trying to carve out a niche for themselves, and I wonder, as a guy who looks at the whole sector, uh, what kind of ripple effects does that have on the whole agricultural sector? Well, I, I, I think the first thing, just, just looking at uh, A&W's financial returns, it seems to be working well for them. Um, but, you know, I, again, I, I worry about this within the general family of free from specific technologies as somehow being more sustainable. Mm -hmm. you know, as Andrew indicated, uh, you know, when we apply antibiotics in livestock, there are withdrawal periods and uh, product is sampled. Um, we make sure that that, that product, the, you know, if there's any residuals or metabolites of any antibiotics, that stays out of the food chain. That's, that's job one, that's, that's, a, that's a focus. So, um, you know, again, th there are some people that have um, opinions and, and feelings about antibiotics in food and uh, there are some people that are prepared to to, to serve that. Um, well, that's but you do about. worry, you know, in, in aggregate, as, as this picks up, you know, is is free from specific technology more sustainable? And, I, and my understanding of it, the answer is pretty clearly no. You think it's less sustainable, but in terms of marketing, it's certainly where a lot of the, well, it's, it's where an increasing share of the marketplace now is. So you are, I presume you are concerned about the fact that, that more and more people seem to want a kind of agricultural product that um, that you seem uncomfortable about. Um, only only uncomfortable to the extent that the connotation is that less technology is more exactly. sustainable, and I believe that's factually incorrect. Hmm. Okay, but if the market ends up going in this direction, what's going to happen? Well, um, as as Andrew indicated, uh, you know, if everybody wanted organic, he'd shift to organic. If everybody wants uh, antibiotic free, the marketplace will shift toward antibiotic free. Um, what that will mean as the supply chain, well, in fact, it, within the farm, adjustments are made, um, we'll have to see because that'll take place over a number of years. Um, you know, just, just to pick another example, uh, cage free layers. There's, there's a greater interest in cage free eggs. Mm -hmm. the, the adjustment to that change will occur over a long period of time, and I, you know, once you get into this, you find, you know, you take the chickens out of the cages. Uh, we have to ventilate them differently. We feed them differently. There's different pest pressures. Right, so your infrastructure. The mortality be rates change. Yeah, for sure. 
And you know, by the time that adjustment, uh, based on a consumer uh, demand, consumer perception, works through the system, you may have a very different farm segment than you started with. Sure. It's not just take them out of the cage. It's not just get rid of the antibiotics. It's not just get rid of no, the No, I get it, but, but are you heartened by the fact that, at least among the foodies, there appears to be an appetite among some people in cities to pay more for food, which is a message you guys have been trying to hammer home for years. <laughs> sure, <laughs> it's great. And, and, you know, and again, I, I think the important thing here is that it's a diverse agricultural system. These are small businesses. They're not, you know, we don't have corporate behemoths that operate farms that you can only get vanilla product from. Mm -hmm. That's not the system we operate in. Um, so there are people, particularly in the urban fringe, farmers in the urban fringe, that are very well positioned to cater to those. The issue, the issue becomes as these get mainstream, and, and that's a concern. Should we let this guy get home to Strathroy? He's got to go to bed. After all, you're up at <laughs> oh, what? we got to milk first. You got to so you're, milk cows again. What time are you up tomorrow morning? It'll be quarter to five. Quarter to every five. Morning. Okay. Can you sleep through the night? <laughs> oh, he has. <laughs> Most nights, some nights. Don't ask my wife. <laughs> you gotta milk them again when you get home. Oh yeah, yep. You milk uh, last thing at night and first thing in the morning. Five and five. Five and five. Five that's and how five. You do it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. Uh, thanks to you both for coming in and sharing your views on agriculture in the province of Ontario tonight. Andrew Campbell, Al Mussel, appreciate it very much. Thanks. Thank you. A pleasure. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.